Welcome to an online Bible study from Harborside Baptist Church, a place of safety, rest, and resupply. We now join Pastor Arbuckle for this week's Bible study. Glad to see so many of you with us online right now. Maybe some other folks will join us here in a little bit. But if you haven't already, turn to 2 Peter chapter 1. And we're going to get started uh, actually in another lesson for as we look at fearlessly facing the future. Uh, we looked at um, certain attitudes, really, that we ought to have when we're looking at those things. You remember from 2 Timothy chapter 3, Paul told Timothy, this know also that in the latter days, perilous times shall come. And what is the word perilous again? Perilous has to do with those fierce times, uh, those hard to deal with times, those hard to bear times. And... Um, there's a good possibility that you may be dealing with some of that even now as we're still in the middle of a pandemic. Uh, I know our family, uh, we're, we're dealing with some, uh, some times as well uh, as uh, my father-in-law is recovering from a heart attack. I trust you'll pray for him. I'll mention him here in an update and prayer request as we uh, have our prayer time. But uh, those attitudes that we need to have when those perilous times come and we face them, you know, whether we like it or not, it's going to happen. Uh, what have we looked at so far? Well, one of the first things we saw was when perilous times come, when you're uh, facing the future, the fierce, fierce future, uh, stay calm. You remember Jesus said in John chapter 14, uh, let not your heart be troubled. Okay. He also mentioned that he uh, was going to give us peace. Uh, so we need to stay calm. We need to stay compassionate. Remember also from John, John chapter four, uh, we looked at the woman at the well and we were talking about compassion, uh, maybe taking you to places where you wouldn't go uh, to come in contact with people that maybe you wouldn't other co otherwise come in contact with. And uh, ultimately that, that um, compassion will always bear fruit. There will always be a harvest when you're compassionate to others. I know that's difficult to do when you're hurting, uh, but it's so very, very necessary. Then last week, we looked at being constructive, stay constructive, or look to edify, look to build people up instead of tearing them down. And we saw those principles last time. And I want us to look at, just to kind of keep the uh, alliteration going, <clears throat> the uh, attitude that we'll look at this evening as we consider, again, fearlessly facing the future we'll look at it from 2 Peter chapter 1, is to be conscientious. Be conscientious, which means, uh, for our study anyway, to be diligent or doing our duty as Christians and doing it well, doing it thoroughly. Okay, I know that uh, maybe you faced in your job, maybe it is that you could um, possibly do something and get away with some shortcuts or something like that, uh, but because of, of your character and your integrity, uh, you decided that you were going to go through all of the steps or whatever it was. You're going to do your best in every regard and so forth. And uh, that is certainly what uh, being conscientious is, is all about, being diligent to do our duty as Christians. So we're going to look at uh, what the Apostle Peter has to say here in 2 Peter chapter 1. And uh, I want to mention, before we go to prayer, let me just mention... Um, an update, a very important thing for us as a church family. Uh, I was in contact with the city earlier in the week, and the building where we've been meeting at the Gold Star Park, uh, they have determined is unsafe uh, for people to use. I was talking to the secretary today, uh, went to actually retrieve our uh, furnishings, our chairs and appropriate and so forth out of there. And I asked her if there were any updates as to what was the, what the problem was with the building and so on. And she said, yes, something is wrong with the, uh, the ductwork in the floor. And uh, water was actually coming up through the floor, uh, through the ductwork. And they're concerned that there might be uh, black mold involved in that. I know a few weeks ago, the men's bathroom was closed because of black mold. So uh, they have decided to go ahead and close it, which means that we're going to have to move again. Uh, I know that sounds like a, like a downer, uh, but uh, we've been in contact with a gentleman uh, again uh, with, that um, 
owns a property over on Virginia Street. Those of you that like barbecue will know where the um, Boathouse Barbecue is. And this property used to be the old Janosaurus building. Uh, they used to uh, also have um, uh, the ambulance, ambulance service. They were storing some of their ambulances there and so on as that building looks, part of it looks like a garage and the other part of it looks like a house. Well, we're gonna be looking at the, the bottom of the house, so to speak. And uh, I go tomorrow uh, to look at that. And uh, the gentleman has decided that he's gonna drop the rent. Uh, so that's gonna be helpful to us. And uh, that also means that um, because it is a bigger, it, it is a bigger building uh, than, than the Gold Star Park. Uh, and we're also gonna have a classroom, an actual classroom, not a kitchen uh, for, the, for the children. And uh, we're gonna be able to leave our furnishings there. Um, and, and rather than set up and tear down and so forth. So that's going to be a blessing. Um, I do also know that um, we're going to have a piano. Uh, the, the church uh, that purchased the building there at Evergreen, the Evergreen Community Building, is now Pathway Community Church. The pastor called me a week or so ago and asked if we were in, still in need if we'd like to have the piano. Uh, we'll look into uh, possibly having it moved for us so we don't have to hurt ourselves. Uh, I've done that a time or two and pianos are just heavy. Uh, so be in prayer about that. Uh, but we're looking forward to that. And um, I want to just mention also in regard to services this Sunday, the third, we're going to go ahead and have a Zoom meeting at 10 o'clock. And then my plan is for us to be in person um, on the 10th. Uh, that is uh, a week from this Sunday, so um, we'll, we'll just plan on that unless you hear from us, uh, hear from me by email or text message or something, a phone call, something like that. But let's have a word of prayer uh, real quickly, and uh, we'll get into our lesson as we want to be conscientious when fearlessly facing the future, okay? Let's have a word of prayer, and then we'll get into uh, 2 Peter chapter 1. Our gracious Heavenly Father, we do thank you for this opportunity that we have come together now. We thank you for these that are joining us online. We ask your blessings upon every family that is represented. And Lord, I, I realize that as we face another move as a church family, I know it can be discouraging. Uh, I know we can look at it and we can wonder, what, what are you doing? Uh, but Father, I, I, I praise you and thank you for moving us all, moving us along throughout our history and uh, you know what's best for us. And we pray, and I pray as their pastor, uh, and I pray for myself as well, Lord, that we would, we would all just follow you. You know uh, the circumstances in regard to this move. You know what's best for us. And we thank you, Lord, for working out these details. And as I go speak to the owner of this other property, I pray that he would be uh, agreeable to just letting us get right in there and, and uh, start having uh, services and, and ministering to our people and maybe reaching out in that area, Lord, we pray. We ask your continued blessings on um, those that are facing physical needs. We'll be mentioning them here in just a little bit. And we pray, Lord, that as we um, are in the midst of perilous times, that you would help us to fearlessly face the future, uh, to have those kind of attitudes that we should, to stay calm, uh, to be compassionate, uh, to look for the opportunity to point somebody else to Christ. To also, Lord, understand that compassion will always bear a harvest. And we thank you for that. And we can be part of that. And we ask that you would help us just to continue to faithfully uh, and diligently, uh, conscientiously work toward that. Help us all to, also to be constructive, Lord, to build one another up. We pray your blessings on our time now in Jesus' name. Amen. I want to read uh, down through the first nine verses here of 2 Peter chapter 1, and then we'll get into our study uh, of being conscientious or being diligent. That's the word that we'll look at here in just a little bit. But let me read uh, 2 Peter 1, beginning of verse 1, down through verse 9. Uh, it says, Simon Peter, a servant of, and an apostle of Jesus Christ, to them that have obtained like precious faith, with us through the righteousness of God our sa and our Savior, Jesus Christ. Grace and peace be multiplied unto you through the knowledge of God and of Jesus our Lord. According as his divine power hath given unto us all things that pertain unto life and godliness 
through the knowledge of him that hath called us to glory and virtue, whereby are given unto us exceeding great and precious promises, that by these ye might be partakers of the divine nature, having escaped the corruption that is in the world through lust. And beside this, giving all diligence, there's our word, the word diligent, it actually in the language here in, in the Greek could be, also be translated conscientious, all right, be conscientious. Besides this, giving all diligence, add to your faith virtue, and to virtue knowledge, and to knowledge temperance, and to temperance patience, and to patience godliness, to godliness brotherly kindness, and to brotherly kindness charity or love. For if these things be in you and abound, they make you that you shall neither be barren nor unfruitful in the knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. But he that lacketh these things is blind and cannot see afar off and for, hath forgotten that he was purged from his old sins. Now, I want us to uh, consider what it means to be conscientious, again, to be diligent uh, in, in our um, Christian life. Uh, I'm sure you all had to be diligent, diligently go about your duties and so on. And I want us firstly to understand that we have to be conscientious uh, to increase our knowledge of God and Jesus Christ. Notice, if you will, again, verse number two, it says, grace and peace be multiplied unto you through the knowledge of God and of Jesus our Lord. According as his divine power hath given unto us all things that pertain unto life and godliness through the knowledge, there's that idea, of him that hath called us to glory and virtue. Now, both of those words, knowledge, or both of those verses have the word knowledge in them, and the word knowledge in the original language of the Greek is the word gnosko. And basically, it means it's not just a head knowledge, okay? Uh, it is an experiential knowledge. Um, you've been there, done that, so to speak. And what Peter is talking about here is that one of the things that we need to be very, very careful about, very, very diligent about, very conscientious about, is our knowledge of God, our knowledge of Jesus Christ. Now, um, he mentions in chapter three, if you want to turn a page over perhaps in your Bible, uh, the last verse of this letter, this second epistle uh, of, from Peter, says, But grow in, in grace and in the knowledge of our Lord and Savior, G Jesus Christ. To him be glory both now and forever. Amen. There's the same idea. Okay. Now, my question to you is this. How, how much do you know about God? I'm not just talking about a head knowledge. I'm not just talking about some of those uh, trivial, you know, trivial pursuit answers that you could get, uh, you could give to questions and so on. Um, you know, there's um, how many books in the Bible, uh, how many in the Old Testament, New Testament, so forth and so on. Um, name the four Gospels and, and name the five books of the Pentateuch. Uh, you know, who, who wrote Genesis? Uh, that kind of thing. Those kind of things, um, they're kind of common knowledge. Even unsaved people know that. Uh, what I'm talking about is your interaction, your experience, what you know from your relationship to the Lord. And is it getting deeper, wider, broader, stronger, more intimate, more uh, loving, and so forth? Are you gaining knowledge day by day by day by day, being diligent, being conscientious to do that? And of course, you, you're familiar with the fact that the only way to do that is to get into God's Word, right? And if we're, we're not doing that on a regular basis, if we're not diligent to spend time with the Lord, you know, reading His Word, praying, all of those kind of things, what happens? Well, we become what uh, one writer says, or one, one writer describes many Christians as sensuous Christians. Uh, he's a, a theologian. His name is R.C. Sproul. And uh, R.C. Sproul says this. He says, many of us have become sensuous Christians living by our feelings rather than our understanding of the word of God. 
sensuous Christians cannot be moved to service, prayer, or study unless they feel like it, okay? Oh, I don't feel like it today. I, you know, I know I should pray, but I don't feel like it today. I know I should read my Bible, but I don't feel like it today. There's a, a, an opportunity maybe as they're out to uh, be compassionate like we talked about a few weeks ago or to uh, be constructive, to edify another brother in Christ, uh, to, um, you know, just help them along in, in their um, relationship with the Lord and their Christian life and so on, but they don't feel like it. So what do they do? They don't do that stuff, okay? And sensuous Christians, again, they cannot be moved to service. Don't ask me to serve. I just don't feel like it, okay? I had a lady, now she was older, uh, she had been serving the Lord in Sunday school and ladies meetings and different things like that for many, many years. I think over my lifetime, by the time I came in contact with her as her pastor, uh, but she asked me um, when I, I mentioned something to her about maybe uh, being part of or, or helping with a particular event. Uh, maybe it was uh, vacation Bible school or junior church or something like that. She said, Pastor, she said, I've been doing that for so long, and I, I really, I'm just kind of tired. I'm just kind of tired. Let the young people serve the Lord. I put in my time, and I just want to rest, okay? All right, I could appreciate that. I didn't press. I didn't force her into it, uh, but to be honest with you, is that is that being diligent? Is that being uh, conscientious of the opportunities and the needs of others and maybe the, the possibility of using what she had known, you know, and grown to know the Lord and, and so forth and in and, and, uh, the many years that she'd been a Christian? Is that conscientious or is that kind of sensuous? Because she didn't feel like it. I have to ask the question, is my walk with God based on feeling? I just don't feel like it today. I just don't feel like a Christian today. I don't, just don't feel saved. I just don't feel loved. I don't feel his grace. What is it? Or is it based on feeling for feeling? Or is it based on faith and the word of God? Which is it? You have to determine where you stand when it comes to your knowledge of the scriptures and your knowledge of God, okay? Who's responsible for that? I can try to teach you and help you and encourage you and, and exemplify as best I can what we're talking about, but you're the one that has to make the determination. You personally, it's kind of like being saved, isn't it? When my parents got saved, uh, I had a set of grandparents that were already saved. Um, so does that mean that I, since I had a set of grandparents and my parents got saved that I was also saved? No, that was a personal relationship, okay? I had to make that decision. And so it is with being conscious, conscientious or diligent to increase in our knowledge of God. How much do you know about the Lord? Do you know more toward the end of 2020 than you did at the beginning? Do you know more at the toward the end of 2020 than you did when you got saved? I sure hope so, but that's your responsibility. And we need to stay diligent to do that. We need to stay conscientious and thinking about that. What do I know about the Lord? Is there something I don't know about the Lord? Is there something that maybe I ought to go searching to find out about the Lord? And we have to, to stay diligent to do that. We need to stay conscientious as well to add other Christian characteristics to our faith. Now, some of those sensuous Christians that we talked about, where, when, do they become, uh, when do they become sensuous Christians? They become sensuous Christians maybe right after they get saved, okay? And they stop right there. They don't do as... Uh, Peter says in uh, verse number five, giving all diligence, add to your faith virtue. We're going to get into these um, uh, virtues here. We did a study several years ago through this passage of scripture in Peter 
uh, about essential virtues. If I'm gonna, if I'm gonna grow in my knowledge of the Lord, if I'm gonna grow in my, uh, yeah, okay, con constructive uh, capabilities, my my ability to edify, my ability to be compassionate, my ability to stay calm and in face in the face of um, fearsome, perilous times and difficult times and hard to bear times and so on. What am I going to have to do? I'm going to have to be diligent personally for myself to go beyond just being saved because one of the things that, and, and there's a, there are actually two chat or two books in the Bible that were written to the same group of people. One, one letter was written to this same, this church in Corinth. And what does Paul call them? He calls them babes in Christ. He calls them babies. Okay. There probably, there might have been some infants in the church, okay, and little children in the church, but there were a whole bunch of adults who knew come to, had come to know the Lord uh, under Paul's ministry and so forth, but they were not diligent to grow after they got saved. The idea here is to add other Christian characteristics to our faith, and who's responsible for that? You are. I am. We all need to be conscientious. We all need to be diligent to do that. So let's look at these virtues here, and uh, I'm gonna I'm gonna stop after we get to the to the last one, uh, and then we'll continue this thought uh, next time. Uh, as far as being conscientious, I want to look at what it means if somebody is conscientious, and then if somebody isn't conscientious. We'll look at that next time. But right now, let's look at what Peter says in verse number five. He says, and besides this, giving all diligence, being conscientious, adding here to your faith, virtue. Now, what is the word virtue? The word virtue basically means moral goodness. And the idea is to have the courage to do right, no matter what the circumstances. Now, we're talking about fearlessly facing the future when perilous times come, okay? Do people sometimes compromise? Sure. Absolutely, they do. I can remember uh, reading stories and so forth of the underground church in the former Soviet Union. And uh, one of the gentlemen, he was a pastor. His name was Georgie Benz. Georgie Benz um, pastored an underground church. The authorities came to him, and uh, they wanted him to um, stop preaching Christ. They wanted him to um, register his church. And of course, you got to understand, registration of the church in the former Soviet Union meant that there were going to be officials come in, and they were basically going to watch what you preached. They were going to listen to what you said. They were going to listen to all of the conversations that went on during the services and so on. And they might even tell you what you're going to preach. A lot of those churches that, that um, were registered because they didn't want the hassle of, you know, maybe the pastor going to jail for preaching the gospel. What did they do? They dropped their standards. They compromised. Okay. Georgie Benz didn't do that. Georgie Benz ended up in, in prison, and eventually he was exiled to the United States of America. Can you imagine? He was put on an airplane, didn't know any bit of English, didn't know anybody in the United States, and he was take, flown to New York. Long story short, his influence in the Soviet Union was so great that uh, there are churches now that can kind of trace their lineage back to Georgie Benz. He was a virtuous man. He had that moral goodness, which um, made him courageous, uh, even in the face of difficult circumstances, to do right. I was reading a, a book recently, uh, and it's kind of a, a leadership book, and the author was talking about leaders, real leaders, men of integrity, men of character, they will always make the hard right rather than the easy wrong. Now, it might be easy to compromise in some area, and you've got to understand there are a lot of compromises that we could come into and describe. We don't have that kind of time, but maybe it's just a small thing. You look at it and you say, well, what difference does it make? What difference does it make if I don't, you know, this one time, 
and you fill in the blank. I'm not going to be diligent. I'm not going to be conscientious. I'm going to let my flesh, I'm going to become sensual. I don't feel like it. What eventually happens? Eventually, what happens is you see people slip away, don't you? We've all come in contact with that, those kind of folks. Maybe some of us have done that a time or two. Now we're back in service to the Lord. We're being uh, conscientious and diligent and so on. Uh, but virtue, we're supposed to add that, okay? You add that to your faith. That's your responsibility. If you're going to um, be the kind of um, helpful, constructive, compassionate, calm uh, Christian, when you face difficulty, you're going to have to give some diligence to adding these things, adding these characteristics. But that moral goodness, we probably all know people like that, right? Uh, they, they, they will always do the right thing, no matter what the circumstances. They're not going to compromise. They're going to, not going to sell out the Lord or anything like that. They're not going to just gloss over some sin that they're faced with. They're, just, they're, going, to, they're going to do right. Uh, Dr. Bob Jones Sr. used to say, do right till the stars fall. And that's what we should do. We should be virtuous, morally good, courageous people, and even in the face of fierce and perilous times. Let's go on. He says, and besides this, giving all diligence, add to your faith virtue and to virtue knowledge. There's the idea again of being knowledgeable, okay, having that relationship, that experiential knowledge not only of the Lord, but uh, in, in, of God in particular, uh, but um, of, of Christ, okay? We've probably all seen, maybe some of you have even worn those little bracelets, you know, those little rubber band type bracelets that, that uh, uh, used to be real popular, and maybe still are today. I haven't seen too many people wearing them around, but um, I've got a, my own collection of them. Uh, but you've maybe seen those uh, particular um, bracelets that have those those four uh, letters on them, WWJD, maybe a question mark, okay? What, is that, what does that stand for? Uh, it stands for a lot of things, but in particular, what would Jesus do, okay? Um, do you know what Jesus would do? Do you know him well enough? Do you have this knowledge of the Lord, the knowledge of our Savior, the knowledge of our Master, uh, our, my, our friend, uh, our Savior, the King of Kings, the Lord of Lords? Do you have the knowledge of his character uh, from reading his word and spending time in prayer and, and, and availing yourself to service and so forth? Do you know what he would do in certain circumstances? You know, um, Paul mentioned in Philippians, let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus. Okay, what was his mind? How, what was on Jesus's mind? At different things. When he faced certain difficult, perilous times himself, what did he do? Do you know that? Have you experienced it? Have you, have you grown closer to the Lord because you've gone through some of the things that he's already gone through? Do you better understand that? And we need to add to our faith that moral goodness, that knowledge of Jesus Christ. What would he do? when faced with circumstances like we're faced with. Let's go on. He says, Get, and, and to virtue knowledge, in verse number six, and to knowledge temperance. That is the, the idea of self-control, okay? Uh, and you, you have to understand, it's the control of the self, okay? It's not being controlled by ourself. I'm not letting my flesh get the best of me. I'm not letting my flesh uh, set the standard, make the rules, uh, decide if I want to do that or don't want to do that, okay? So what is it? It's, it's discipline, okay? Um, I was reading another book uh, about uh, two years ago, I guess it was, and the gentleman was talking about uh, this fellow, even though he's retired from the military now, he still gets up at 445 in the morning, now, 4.45 in the morning, I am probably asleep uh, unless my wife has to go to work and she's sometimes she's up. So I hear her and I get up sometimes. It's not always uh, because I've already set the coffee pot and that kind of thing. I did get up this morning uh, about five o'clock this morning. She was already up. I got the coffee pot started for her and that kind of thing. Uh, but this gentleman, he's even though he doesn't have to, he's retired from the military. 
Uh, he does have his own company and so forth, but he doesn't have to get up at 445, but he still does that. And um, his, his, one of the statements that he makes is, you do today what others won't, so you can do tomorrow what others can't. And that makes a lot of sense to me. You know, especially if you're, you're thinking about maybe uh, getting in better shape or something like that, or maybe it is you're, you're wanting to increase your knowledge of the Lord and so on. Maybe it is that you'll get up a little earlier. Whatever you happen to do, you're going to, if you're going to be temperate, temperate, you're going to be self-controlled. You're going to be disciplined. And how many undisciplined people do we know? How many times have we been undisciplined? Okay. Uh, how, how important is discipline to children? Now, maybe when they're little, they don't understand that. But they need to have discipline, don't they? They need to be disciplined, right? I was reading a letter. I've been privileged to get some things that belong to my dad years ago. And uh, he was writing his parents uh, in January of 1967. He was in Thailand at that time. And um, my grandparents had written him a letter that he was answering. And he was talking about uh, a visit that my mother and my sister and I uh, and, and our little dog, her name was Corky, um, made in about Christmas time uh, of that year. Uh, actually of 1966. And um, my dad was talking about the fact that uh, my grandparents had noticed that my sister and I, now you've got to understand I'm four and my sister, she was about, she was six at that time. So we got a six-year-old and a four-year-old away from home, long flight. We did fly in. My grandparents picked us up at the, uh, the airport in Indianapolis, Indiana. And we spent time with Grandma and Grandpa Arbuckle uh, about Christmas time, 1966. My dad was in Thailand at that time, 1967. Uh, just a few, a few days or weeks after our visit, he answered uh, their letter that um, kind of enumerated some of the things. And, and he made the comment. He said, I, I'm, I'm glad you mentioned and glad you saw the politeness, the politeness. I don't remember all those conversations that I had with my grandfather when I was four, but my grandfather apparently understood and saw in my sister and I some discipline. And my dad was saying, M.E., that's what he called my mom. She does a really good job in, in making sure that the children are polite. Why was that? It was necessary. There was discipline in our home. There's nothing wrong with that. Too often when we get out of our parents' home, we become adults. What happens to our self-discipline? That's what Paul is talking about, that temperance, that self-control, not being controlled by your flesh, but you control your flesh. You be disciplined. If you're going to add those things, it's your responsibility. You have to be diligent. You have to be conscientious. He goes on and he says, uh, giving all diligence, add to your faith virtue, to virtue, knowledge, to knowledge, temperance, and to temperance, patience. Oh my goodness. Oh my gracious. Look there. There's that word again, which we all love, right? Just be patient. Well, it's not what we normally think of. This particular word uh, is, the, is translated, could, should be translated the word endurance. That's what it means, okay? And it, it means to maintain a response that glorifies God no matter what the external circumstances. Those perilous times come, guess what? I'm going to endure. I'm going to bear up under all the pressure, all the problems, all the difficulty, all of the peril, the hard to deal with, hard to bear times, those fierce times, and I'm going to bear up under them, and I'm going to glorify God no matter what. That's the idea of endurance. And too often in our day, and I'm sure in, in Peter's day, in Paul's day, the disciples' day, Jesus' day, we didn't see people that had that kind of endurance. As a matter of fact, when Jesus started talking uh, about 
what it meant to be saved and what it meant to be a Christian and what it meant to, you, you know, to eat his flesh and drink his blood. Many of his disciples, many of his followers, it was a hard saying. It was difficult for them to, to bear up under, to endure. What did they do? They walked away. And too often what happens, even in the 21st century, when we have a completed scripture, when we have all of the Bible here, when we have those precious, exceeding great and precious promises and so on, the fact that God has given us all things that pertain unto life and godliness, we have all that we need right here. What happens when difficulty comes? People don't endure. They don't bear up under it. They don't have that kind of patience, that endurance that they need to have. They don't have, and, and they don't maintain a response that glorifies God. Sometimes it's anything but, right? He goes on, he says, add to knowledge, temperance, and the temperance, patience, and the patience, godliness. That particular word godliness is a god-fearing lifestyle that promotes righteousness and opposes evil this makes up the engine so to speak of loving god with all your heart okay you want to love the lord you want to get to know him you want to properly um, represent him in front of other people right and what is that? Well, you're going to fear him. And that lifestyle promotes righteousness and opposes evil. Let me just mention something back here about endurance and maintaining that response that glorifies God. I mentioned this Sunday um, when we had to take my father-in-law to the emergency room because of his heart attack and so on. I'll give you an update on him here just a little bit. Um, but I confess. Um, I, I was I was not maintaining very well. I was not maintaining the response that glorified God. I didn't want to do that uh, because of the restrictions we couldn't go in. Uh, my mother-in-law got a chance to go see him. I was talking to a friend of mine earlier today, and I said, "Man, I wanted to." And I I mentioned this Sunday, but I'll say it again because it applies. I wanted to kick the door in. And I wanted to make sure that he was okay, my father-in-law was okay, that my mother-in-law got a chance to see him because he, he was in a, in a very serious way. We didn't know if he was going to come out of the hospital alive or not. But God got a hold of me. My wife even mentioned it. We came back home, and the following day, Sunday, she said, why didn't you say anything? And it wasn't that I didn't want to. It said I knew I better not. Because I knew that what was going to come out of my mouth would not have glorified the Lord. It just wouldn't have. And I'm not a good example of that. I'm telling you what, I, I, wanted, I wanted to go in there and kick heads and take names. I really did. But that would have been counterproductive. And as it was, God worked the thing out a whole lot better than I can. And I did. I just let him do it. And that's really what we need to do. We need to maintain, we need to endure difficulty, and we need to respond in such a way to glorify God no matter what. But back to godliness. This particular idea is uh, could be summed up in this kind of um, mathematical uh, equation, so to speak. Uh, devotion Plus discipline, we talked about that uh, or, or just a, a little bit ago, right? That's self-control, okay? Devotion plus discipline equals godliness. It's that lifestyle, okay? And that really is what Christianity should be, is, isn't it? It should be a lifestyle. I was privileged to be in a hospital room years ago. A gentleman from our church was up in the uh, in Columbus, undergoing some heart um, uh, procedures and so on, and, and um, the one of the registration people came into the to his room. I was sitting there, and I said, "You want me to step out?" And he said, "No, Pastor." He said, "I want you to stay." So I just stayed, and the guy went ahead, and you know, we introduced each other and so on, and and um, 
the gentleman went down through this series of questions and he wanted to know what religion this gentleman was. What religion are you? And this person from our church said, well, I'm a Christian. What are you? And I thought that was really, that, that was really, really a good, a good response. This man had Christianity as a lifestyle. It's not just something that, well, I go to Baptist church, you know, when do you go? Well, I go on Sundays once in a while, go on Christmas and, and uh, Easter and that kind of thing. Um, no, that's not what we're talking about. That's not necessarily godliness, is it? Godliness is, again, that God-fearing lifestyle. Promotes righteousness, opposes evil. It's devotion plus discipline. That's what it is. We're devoted to the Lord because of who he is, what we know of him. And we're disciplined enough to make sure that we stay temperate. We stay disciplined. We stay self-controlled. Okay, We're controlling our flesh, not the other way around. We're controlling our emotions, not the other way around. He goes on and he says, uh, to patience, godliness, to godliness, verse number seven, Brotherly kindness. That is the word Philadelphia. Uh, you've heard it before. If you've ever been to Philly, you know what that means. It is the uh, city of brotherly love, and that's what Philadelphia means. But here in our context here, it is a God-engendered affection for and service to those in the household of faith. Other Christian people, okay? Now, that doesn't mean that you just would you, you ask somebody before you help them, are you a Christian? Do you go to church anywhere? I don't remember seeing you at Harborside Baptist Church because you're not one of our members. I don't think I'm going to help you. No, that's not what we're talking about. But specifically, we're talking about helping those who are also saved. That's what it means. And you have to be diligent about doing that. You have to be conscientious about doing that. He finishes up this particular list of characteristics, godly virtues. He says that the godliness, brotherly kindness, and the brotherly kindness, charity, or love. And that particular type of love is the agape love. It is that supreme sacrificial love. Another way of defining it is that it is a love that is deliberately focused. Now catch this. It is a love that is deliberately focused on the welfare of others. Okay. It's deliberately focused on the welfare of other people. I'm doing this for their benefit. It's going to help them out. In a matter of speaking, it just goes right along with our last lesson of being constructive, of edifying, of building up people. Okay, You do that. You love them because it's going to build them up. And it is primarily focused on their spiritual welfare. Now, physical wel welfare is part of that, but it's primarily their spiritual welfare, okay? So what, are, what does it mean to be conscientious? It means to be diligent, to increase in our knowledge of the Lord. What do you know about the Lord right here, right now, at 17 minutes till 8 on the 30th day of December 2020? What do you know about him? Are you adding to that? Do you know more today than you did when you got saved? Do you know more today than beginning of the year or last year? That's what we're talking about. I can, I can only do so much for you, folks. You know that. I can only teach you so much, right? I can present the material. You understand that. It's your responsibility to take it, ingrain it. You know, do uh, maybe there are some that, that uh, you should just throw out, okay? I'll give you that, all right? But what are you knowing? What are you increasing? What do you know about the Lord? And are you increasing in your knowledge of the Lord? That experiential knowledge. And then are you adding Christian characteristics to your faith? That's your responsibility. I can encourage you. I can go down through a list. I can explain it to you. I can parse the Greek and all of that kind of thing for you. But unless you take it and you internalize it and then let it come out in your life, there's nothing I can do for you. We have to be diligent to do that, conscientious to do that. That's our responsibility. Because if we're doing that, 
that's going to help us fearlessly face the future. It's going to help us present the kind of Christianity that people outside the church and outside our doorstep need to see. It's going to make sure it's going to make it possible for us to point them to Christ and not have the baggage of them saying, well, you know, I used to work with that guy. You've heard me say it before, uh, in, introduced myself as a pastor of such and such a church. And, and uh, they asked me, does so-and-so go to church? And I said, yes, he does or she does. They do. Well, as long as they're there, I'm not coming to your church. I can't believe you let people like that in your church. I work with them, work, for, work with them for decades. I've heard the filth that comes out of their mouth, and I see the way they act. And they're supposed to be Christian? Okay, that's not what we're talking about, right? We want to make sure that we're presenting a proper example of Christ-likeness to the world. And we have to be diligent to do it. We have to be conscientious to do it. I have to do it myself. We all have to do it ourselves. So conscientiously, diligently, adding to the faith that we have these virtues, these characteristics that will help us to fearlessly face the future because perilous times are here. And we need to make sure that we give a good representative our good representative, yes, of, of Jesus Christ. So are you being conscientious? Are you being diligent? Are you adding these things to your faith? I sure hope so. It's our responsibility. We're going to look at a little bit further next time. We're going to look at what it means if you do that, and then we're going to look at what it means if you don't do that. Because there's some interesting um, examples here and some truths that we're going to finish up with next time. But right now, let's have a word of prayer, and then we'll look at our prayer list. Our gracious Heavenly Father, we thank you for this opportunity that we have to look into your word. We thank you for the Apostle Peter. Peter understood, Lord, what it meant to compromise. He did that not once, not twice, but three times. And Lord, we, we pray that you would help us to learn these lessons. He was concerned with those that he wrote to that they would be diligent. He mentions it a couple different times. He was, was also concerned with their knowledge of Jesus Christ, as we should be. He was concerned that they would be diligent and conscientious to add these virtues, these characteristics of Christianity to their lives. I'm sure that he taught them how to do that. But I also know that he was aware of the fact that that was their responsibility. And it's our responsibility individually to examine our lives and see where we are and see what we know about Christ and whether we're gaining in that area. If we're getting to know by experience Jesus and how he would respond and then adding these characteristics that are so vital to making the, a good showing, as it were, before the unsaved. We ask your blessings now on these that we'll bring before your throne. And we pray, Lord, that you would just superintend in a mighty way in every circumstance. We'll thank you for it in Jesus' name. Amen.